News of the Times Wicked Wednesdays The Victorian Sex Cult of the Agamonites The Conclusion Welcome to News of the Times Wicked Wednesdays where we look at events and organisations that were making the headlines of their day. In today's episode we're looking at the Agamonites, regarded as a sex cult in the Victorian times. It was started in 1846 and closed down in 1956. Like most cults, it was dependent on a dynamic leader. The Agapmonites featured two consecutive leaders. In this concluding episode, we are looking at the successor leader of the cult, John Smith Piggott, and the final end of the Agapmonites. We really hope you enjoy the episode. Picking up from the previous episode of the Agapmonites, it is 1896. Founding father, Brother Prince, as he is referred, has come out of his self-imposed retreat after the scandal of the public deflowering he performed in their chapel for spiritual reasons of a 16-year-old Zoe. The scandal sent many of his followers fleeing, and Brother Prince was not to be seen outside his abode of love for many years. Funds have dwindled, and the communal settlement is in clear decline. But at the age of 85, Brother Prince comes out of the shadows and announces that he shall be building a new church. The new church is to be ornately built in Clapton, North London, complete with a 155-foot tower of Portland stone, an oak hammer beam roof, and a large stained glass window representing the submission of women to man. It is rumoured to cost the outrageous sum of £20,000 to build, worth approximately £3.5 million today. The Clapton Church was dedicated to the Ark of the Covenant. Its preacher was the dashingly good-looking Hugh Smythe Piggott. Piggott had had a colourful life before becoming an ordained Anglican preacher. By the time he arrived to lead the Agapmont Knight Church, Piggott was in his forties and was, by all accounts, a vibrant evangelical preacher. As such, with the association of the church with the Spraxton Agapmont community, connection kept quiet, the church congregation grew quickly. In 1899, Henry James Prince, the founder of the Agapmonites, dies at the age of 88. His death came as a complete surprise to his flock, who truly believed him to be the Messiah who would never die. Stories came out of many of the congregation having become disillusioned. There was a real belief that he would live forever. In September 1902, the Reverend Smythe Piggott was officially consecrated as the new Saviour of Mankind at the Church of the Covenant in Clapton. A crowd of some 6,000 spectators booed and hissed him during his inauguration as the new Messiah. From the Northampton Mercury, the 12th of September, 1902, a strange sect, the Agapmonites again. An echo of the Agapmonites is aroused by a strange story from Clapton. It appears that on Sunday night, during a service at the church known as the Ark of the Covenant at Clapton Common, a person who occupied the dais declared that he was the Christ come to visit the earth a second time. The pastor is said to be the Reverend J. H. Smythe Piggott. The original Agapmon, which is Greek for the abode of love, was established at Spraxton near Bridgewater in Somersetshire, in where 
Henry James Prince and his followers, formerly persons of property, lived in common, professing to devote themselves to innocent recreation and to maintain spiritual marriage. Prince held ultra-revivalist movements at Lampeter in 1836 and finally claimed to be an incarnation of the deity with corresponding authority over his followers. Mr. Piggott acknowledges that he is a disciple of Brother Prince. Prince was originally a clergyman of the Church of England, and while curate of Charles Lynch, he began to preach the doctrines now held by the sect which bears his name. What these exactly are is known only to the believers. Brother Prince, as he styled himself, attracted a large number of wealthy ladies and gentlemen, including several clergymen, and in 1849 they built and luxuriously furnished a sort of convent at Spraxton, a hamlet six miles from Bridgewater in Somerset. This is known as the Agapemont, or Abode of Love, and under the leadership of Brother Prince, many took their residences there. They held no communication with the outer world, but lived in complete and luxurious isolation. Money was plentiful, and Brother Prince was accustomed to drive into Bridgewater in a carriage with four horses and postillions, outriders clearing the way before him with cries, Behold, he cometh. The sect fell on evil times, and the numbers seriously decreased. Some handsome legacies, however, resuscitated the community, and in 1896 its first church, that of the Ark of the Covenant, was erected at Clapton, at a cost of about £20,000, and this was opened by Brother Prince himself. Three years later he died, some days elapsing before the news was publicly known, such is the exclusive character of the Agapimon. In fact, almost the first local intimation of his decree was the arrival at Bridgewater of a special train from London conveying nearly 100 Clapton disciples to his funeral. The interment took place in the grounds at the rear of the Gapemont, where other inmates are buried, the place being duly licensed for the purpose. Some of the community still reside conventionally at Spraxton. The residence of the Reverend J. H. Smythe Piggott, Cedar Lodge Clapton, is still a centre of attraction for the idle and the curious, to say nothing of the ubiquitous journalist, but its mysterious occupant adheres rigorously to the rules he has laid down for himself, and not for the present to be seen or spoken to save by members of his sect. Nor will Mr. Piggott be communicated with by letter if reports speak truly. Since Sunday evening last, when he announced himself to be the reincarnated Messiah, he had a host of callers, but with no stranger has he exchanged a word or sign. Not that Mr. Piggott denies himself his friends. It was reported in the district that Mr. Piggott had left London for his abode of love in Somerset, but this Mr. Piggott's visitor contradicted. Mr. Piggott was home, but could not be seen, nor was it possible for his friend to make himself the bearer of a communication to him. Several elderly ladies left the lodge during the colloquy, where there was a covered bath chair waiting at the door for another caller. Considerable mystery veils the residence of the pastor, and few except those of the elect are allowed admission. A privileged person has given a correspondent many curious details regarding the interior of Cedar Lodge. 
The household consists of Mr. Piggott himself and five servants, including the housekeeper. The latter interviews everyone who comes to the door. The house is furnished on a scale of luxury equal to that which characterised the abode of love, over which the notorious brother prince once provided. Studies of the nude are prominently disposed upon the walls of most of the rooms, including the reverend gentleman's bedroom. In the hall are many bronze statues of goddesses naked and unabashed, and an excellent billiard table points to sporting tastes. Mr. Piggott indeed is said to be a very good billiard player. Almost every day for the last few months prayer meetings have been held in the house. Those present, with the exception the Reverend Smith Piggott being ladies, many of whom have driven up to the house in carriages. Rumour has it that he had attempted to walk on water on Clapton Pond, but the attempt failed. From the Taunton Courier and Western Advertiser, the 24th of September, 1902, The New Messiah, Another Service at the Ark. Mounted police called in. Another service was held in the Ark of the Covenant, the worshipping place of the Agapmonites at Clapton on Wednesday, but on this occasion strangers were rigorously excluded. Again, a large crowd assembled, but although the Reverend J. Smythe Piggott, who has gained notoriety proclaiming himself Messiah, was the victim of a hostile demonstration, there was an absence of the turbulence and violence which characterised the proceedings on Sunday morning. At quarter past seven, quite a couple of thousand people, male and female, must have been on the spot, many of them cyclists, who had evidently come from a distance to gratify their curiosity. Subsequently, the Agapmonites themselves appeared on the scene, and after passing the scrutiny of the stalwart guards at the gates, they wended their way into the church, using the side doors for the purpose, and carefully avoiding the front entrance. At length a carriage arrived, and onlookers, amusing that it may contain Mr. Piggott, raised a howl of derision, which speedily changed to laughter upon three ladies alighting from the vehicle. A moment or two later another carriage was driven hurriedly up, and as Mr. Piggott emerged, accompanied by his wife and secretary, and was greeted with a storm of indignation. Mr. Piggott appeared no way disconcerted, for he acknowledged the angry salutation by smilingly raising his hat. Exactly an hour was occupied by the service. The carriage was again driven up, but the crowd was kept at a safe distance. As Mr. Piggott walked towards the brougham, the people vehemently howled at him, but the reverend gentleman quietly took his seat after saying thank you to Superintendent McFadden, who was responsible for the police arrangements. The carriage, headed by a mounted constable, was driven to see the lodge, followed by hundreds of people who made themselves hoarse with shouting. They gathered in front of the lodge, and stones are said to have been thrown, whilst an attempt was made to force the back entrance of the residence. Matters began to assume a serious aspect, but the mounted police were reinforced, and at last the throng dispersed. A public challenge to Mr. Smith. The Reverend W. Brown, who holds services in the Broadway Hall in Crouch End, has published a challenge to the Reverend Smythe Piggott in these terms. 
I hereby challenge the Reverend J. H. Smythe Piggott to meet me in debate. The subject shall be his claim to be Jesus Christ, the basis of argument to be Holy Scripture. Either at Broadway Hall Crouch End or any public platform he may choose, I will meet him fearlessly and fairly. Mr. Brown concludes, The Messiah established his position by arguments from the Old Testament and by working miracles. Will Mr. Piggott favour mankind with similar signs and by arguments from the Old Testament and the New? Piggott did not take up the challenge, but rather focused himself on upgrading the somewhat dilapidated premises at Spraxton, where he moved to. To regenerate the ageing residents of the Agapemont, he vetted and recruited 50 young, nubile female followers to join the congregation. He modernised the abode of love with a telephone and motor car and had several new cottages built. New farm stock was brought in to upgrade the forlorn farm. Connections were made with visitors from the Norwegian chapter of the Agapmonites. Second wife. In 1902, the new Messiah, Reverend Piggott, took on a second wife, Ruth Ann Priest, from which he eventually had three children, glory, power and life. Three years after Piggott's divine status announcement, he was again in the news with this story recounted by the Registrar of Births and Piggott's new child named Glory. From the Western Supermare Gazette and General Advertiser, 16th of August, 1905. The Agapmanites, latest sensation at the abode of love. A remarkable christening. After nearly three years of mysterious silence, the members of that amazing sect known as the Agapmanites have spoken out into a fever of excitement down at their beautiful settlement at Spraxton, known as the Abode of Love. A son has been born to the divine leader, the Reverend J. H. Piggott, who since 1887 has worn the mantle of Brother Prince. Amid splendid ceremony, the child has been christened Glory, and both Glory and his mother received homage daily down at the abode. For the child Glory, according to them, is a divinity. Piggott has now come forward with an entirely new sensation. A few days ago, the registrar of the Bridgewood district was sent for with the message that he was wanted at the abode of love at Spraxton. I have, says the leader's correspondent, interviewed the Bridgewater district registrar, who was at present at the extraordinary christening ceremony of Piggott's sensational baby. It seems that he received a special message to hurry over to the abode of love, which is about six miles from town. He drove over and was received at the gates of the abode by Piggott's secretary, Mr. Reed. At the house, Mrs. Reed met him. Are you the Bridgewater Registrar? she said excitedly. Yes, he replied, I am. Then, she added dramatically, you are about to be admitted into the presence of the Almighty. This somewhat startled the registrar, who, although a man of peculiar experience in his line of business, had never met anything quite so disconcerting before. Follow me, said the lady. The registrar obeyed and Mrs. Reed led him into the sacred precincts of the chapel, on which Brother Prince spent a fortune. Inside the beautiful building were forty persons, 
Mr. Reed and Mr. Piggott and Mr. Registrar were the only men present. Two ladies were assembled in a silent worshipping crowd with their eyes fixed expectantly upon a lovely couch. Here, in costly clinging robes, lay a beautiful young woman, and at the foot of the couch was a tiny child dressed in snowy white. A silent woman knelt at the foot of the couch holding the baby. "'Who is the father of this child?' asked the registrar. "'I am,' replied the leader of the Agapmanites. "'And who is the mother?' Piggott pointed the beautiful woman lying on the couch. "'That is she,' he said. "'Her name, Roose Priest. "'Her occupation, she is a lady,' replied the reverend gentleman with much dignity. This was not quite sufficient for the official gentleman from Bridgewater. He wanted more facts, and eventually she was entered as a lady of independent means. The child was entered in the name of Glory. The ceremony being over, Mr. Piggott announced that a triumph choral service would be held to celebrate this wonderful occasion. He invited the registrar to stop and see it all through. This he did, and says he was much impressed by the beautiful singing and the wonderful strains of the organ. The correspondent of the morning leader says, I understand that the real and legal Mrs. Smythe was present, or at least in the near vicinity of the chapel during the official glorification of Glory Piggott. The news of the Agapmanites and their leader who claimed to be the Messiah and the birth of the child named Glory to Piggott's second spiritual wife made the news internationally. From the New York Evening News, the 17th of August, 1905, as the world moves, a queer religious people living in a retreat known as the abode of love is ruled by a gentleman who calls himself reverend and the messiah but is now the father of a newborn infant the mother ruth priest and others hail him as a divine being the agapmanites is an english collection of human beings and with the far-famed British absence of humour, they have named this little Englishman Glory Smythe Piggott. It takes an Agapmanite and an English one to get together three such incongruous names. Some day, when the Agapmanites break up, little Glory Smith Piggott will drive a cab in the Strand or shout, by your leave, as he pushes a load of baggage along the platform of some railway station. At present, the new-born little gentleman is visited by great crowds that hail him and do him homage. The world looks on in amazement at this display of credulity. Rumblings have been heard for quite some time that Piggott was still an ordained minister with the Church of England. In 1909, this was to change. Piggott was summoned to the church court, a summons he ignored. Piggott left the country travelling to Norway to visit the Agapmanite sect there during the trial. It was said that a large contingency of people wishing to tar and feather Piggott, as he had escaped to Norway, the crowd insisted on justice, and they tarred Piggott's secretary, instead. From the Bexhill on Sea Observer, the 13th of March, 1909, not long ago a body of raiders at the abode of love mistook Mr. Reed for Smythe Piggott and covered his head with a policeman's helmet filled with tar. The ecclesiastical court demolished Piggott. It was believed that there was no one from the Agapmanites attending the court. From the Chard and Ilminster News, the 13th of March, 1909, Piggott unfrocked, deposed and degraded at Wells Cathedral, 
no action for blasphemy. The ceremony of deposing the Reverend John Hugh Smythe Piggott from all offices in the Church of England was solemnly conducted by the Bishop of Bath and Wells on Saturday in the choir of the ancient cathedral. As in the case of the proceedings of the constitutory court, the defendant ignored them and was not present to hear himself deposed and degraded, neither, so far as was known, was any of his sympathisers in attendance. As the proceedings were taken under the Clergy Discipline Act of 1892, the ceremony is fortunately a singular one, and the last of the kind was at Durham in 1897. The public have late been made familiar with the remarkable life of Smith Piggott and his disciples at the Spraxton Agapmon, and it is unnecessary to recall facts which have been regarded with abhorrence throughout the country. So far as Saturday's proceedings went, they failed to arouse special public interest in the old city, for fewer than two persons, including several ladies, attended to see the seal set on the hypocritical life of the Reverend J. H. Smythe Piggott. He is now entirely removed, disposed and degraded from the offices of priest and deacon in the church, but whether it will have any effect on his future mode of life remains to be seen. The defrocking seems to have had little obvious effect to the encapsulated Spraxton community. However, clearly all was not well internally with this news flash regarding the second wife, Ruth Priest, attempting to escape from the enclosed community. From the Central Somerset Gazette, 13th of January 1911, Sister Ruth Escapes Again. The scandal, which has now for many years ranged itself around the peaceful little village of Spraxton in Somerset, through the conduct first of the notorious Prince and for more recently of the modern Messiah, John Hugh Smythe Piggott, looks like once more attaining to front place before the public eye, so states the Penny Illustrated Paper. The journal adds, According to the information supplied a few days before Christmas, Sister Ruth, Miss Ruth Annie Priest, who was for many years Piggott's chief bride, has again escaped. In company with another inmate of the famous abode, Sister Ruth left Spraxton three days before Christmas and immediately crossed the channel to seek refuge with the Agapmanite friends on the continent. At the time of going to press, we have received further important information of a startling character that throws a new light upon Piggott's reason for pursuing Miss Priest across the continent. Our readers will be anxious to see this moral freak Smythe Piggott brought to bay before other innocent women fall to his persuasion. His career as a decoyer of the innocents is fast nearing the curtain. News reports announce that Sister Ruth is to be discarded and replaced with a new wife who conveniently brings with her £5,000. But even more astoundingly, Piggott is making a speedy retreat to the Agapmanite sect in Norway. It would seem that once he had been defrocked, he was now ripe for criminal investigation without the protection of the church. What had happened to funding that had been given to support the poor within the parish? The public were keen to see what they felt to be justice. Police investigations were underway collecting evidence. It was intimated that Ruth Priest, the ex-spiritual wife, was helping in the investigation against Piggott. Piggott, hearing rumours that his incarceration was imminent, decided to make a hasty retreat abroad. From the People, the 3rd of March, 1912, Piggott's 
farewell to his women dupes, Sister Ruth to be discarded. For the first time since the self-styled Messiah has been at the abode of love, press representatives were allowed to attend the little chapel. Smythe Piggott delivered a farewell address to his women dupes or wives, as he called them, and in the course of it he formally discarded Sister Ruth, the mother of his three children. He gave a reason for this, the fact that she had ceased to be a living force in our life. As a matter of fact, another dupe known as Sister Faith, who is possessed of £5,000, is to take her place. Action by police. The head of the Agapmanites ascertained by the merest chance some days ago that the slow movements of the Home Office direction had quickened into decisive action by additional information that had come into their hands. For nearly three years, the question of criminal prosecution has occupied the attention of the authorities. Following the trial of Piggott at Wells Cathedral in January 1909 and his subsequent unfrocking for conduct unbefitting a clergyman and horrible immorality of life. Inspector Williams of the Somerset County Police was instructed by the Treasury to ascertain if any reliable evidence could be gathered upon which a criminal charge could be launched. Abundant evidence was found, but the difficulty was to induce the victims of the Messiah's lust and greed to testify against him. For the possible charges against him fell under two heads. There were, first, his acts of grave immorality, but secondly, the man who calmly debauched his first soul bridge in the very presence of the poor, faded, legal wife. Those dupes, as the newspaper described Piggott's wives, that are found hailing him as more than man in the Spraxton Agapemont, have literally been stripped of everything that the luxury life of the abode may be maintained. They are destitute. All has been handed to the common fund, as it is termed, and for the purchase of a postage stamp or a packet of hairpins, this poor company of spiritual wives must humbly opportune Brother Douglas Hamilton in his capacity as Treasurer and Lord High Steward. The withdrawal of Piggott from this country, whether for a period or forever, is attended by circumstances that to no one person at least spells tragedy. Who has not heard of that forlorn figure in the Spraxton drama, Miss Ruth Annie Priest, very first of that company who fell into the subtle snare of the doctrine of spiritual wifehood? The Tragedy of Ruth If ever any woman has been the sport of idle, half-pitying tongues, Sister Ruth has. In his own house, with his legal wife looking complacently on and murmuring the good pleasure of the master, Piggott took Ruth Annie Priest and, to use his own words, made spiritual affinity with her. To remain behind, Piggott is leaving the country immediately for Norway. Most of his brides, those lesser lights of love, who console his harassed mind, are accompanying him. But Sister Ruth is not to cross the North Sea. The Messiah has had a revelation and has delivered the same to his obedient disciples. No longer must Sister Ruth be hailed as the chief companion of the head of the Agapmanites, for the Messiah has delivered himself of a second revelation to his docile flock. Sister Faith is in future to be the chief of this weird company of brides, 
who have stripped themselves of reputation. The English chapter of the Agapmonites was passed over to Brother Douglas Hamilton, a quite secretive man who was looked at as much more orthodox. The cult dwindled. Piggott later returned when the things had calmed down and seemed to turn his attention to spiritualism, paranormal and seances. In 1927, Piggott died. From the Argus, Melbourne, the 12th of March, 1927, the abode of love. The Agabonite leader is dead. Notorious sect recalled. The Reverend T. H. Smythe Piggott has died at the Spraxton Agapmonite from influenza and will be buried in the grounds where the founder, Brother Prince, was interred. The inmates refuse to admit the death as they profess to believe that their Messiah lives on forever. Piggott's two sons and a daughter by Sister Ruth, who is chief of the Messiah's four wives, were at Spraxton at the time of Piggott's death, together with Sister Ruth and Piggott's lawful wife. Latterly, Piggott has turned to spiritualism and his services have been converted into seances. The sect of the Agapmonites having for its primary objective the spiritualism of the matrimonial state was founded in 1846 by the Reverend Henry Jones Prince, a clergyman of the Church of England. He obtained a following of 500 and it was given out by Prince known as the Beloved or the Lamb, the names by which the Agapmonites designated their leader, that his disciples must divest themselves of their possessions and throw themselves into the common stock. With the money thus obtained, the house at Spraxton, which was to become known as the Abode of Love, was enlarged and furnished luxuriously, and three sisters who contributed £6,000 each were immediately married to three of Prince's nearest disciples. On the death of Brother Prince, the Reverend T. H. Smythe Piggott, pastor of the Ark, became the acknowledged head of the sect. He was born in 1852 and of an old Somerset County farm, and had a remarkable life as university man, a sailor before the mast, a soldier, a coffee planter, curate in the Church of England, and Salvation Army evangelist. Then in 1897, he was converted to the views of Prince. Piggott, after pronouncing most remarkable views in which he proclaimed himself as the Messiah, retired to the abode of love. In Somerset in 1905, a long silence was broken by the announcement that a son had been born to Piggott by his spirit wife, Miss Ruth Priest, an inmate of the Agapemont. The child was registered as glory. The birth of a second child aroused so much public indignation that an attempt was made to tar and feather Piggott, and very shortly afterwards proceedings were instituted against him by the Bishop of Bath and Wells under the Clergy Discipline Act. By 1929, the sect had 33 women, one girl and four men left as its congregation. Sister Ruth had also returned and in an unexpected way became the sect's leader upon the death of Piggott. Sister Ruth died in 1956 and the property was sold off in 1958. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, the Victorian sex cult of the Agapmonites. The conclusion. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, 
suggestions and into action is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload five days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times and I am Robin Coles.